Every time I get into Nehemiah, I have trouble. I, I have trouble with my back. My shoulders freeze up. There's all sorts of issues. And no, I don't walk on water and do other things like that. But it's because of the tension, I don't get up from the computer because that's where all this stuff originates and is, and the Word of God is printed out on there. And so I, my wife says, yells in if she's at home, are you still on the computer? And uh, she's my alarm clock, and so I have to jump off of it and start doing my shoulder and arm exercises done, freeze and all of that stuff. But it's so difficult because I'll transcend from one and then I'll jump to 10 or I'll go somewhere else. Because all of it, it, I finished a couple weeks ago with my injury. I knew I could finish Nehemiah on the PowerPoint. And so that all got done. And then I go back and start reading again. And I say, this, this is incredible. This is wonderful what we're getting. It's just sensational. And so I was excited about it yesterday, about this morning. My shoulders feel pretty good. And so we're ready to fly a little bit. We are just into the first chapter, and so um, should be okay. No? I have a green light, guys. <clears throat> Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah begins with Nehemiah, not in Israel. He is 800 miles away. He is over in Shushan, or Susa, the media Persian Empire. And can you just go and advance it? There we go. Is that me? Okay, that's great. So you see Susa over here to the far right on this map, and then you can trace it, the route that he will be taking back into Jerusalem. And this map will pop up in and in and out throughout our study you had, we talked about it last uh, three weeks ago before the missions conference. Now, the very few verses, verses 1, 2, and 3, just, in, just an easy review is this. He's, Nehemiah calls in some of his Jewish friends and says, hey, tell me some things. I'm curious. And he says, how are you guys doing? And, and the Jews that you're with and the people that are out you know, in our city here in captivity, how are they? And he said, they're miserable. Nehemiah got told that. He says, well, what, what's, what's the word from Jerusalem back home? How are the people back there? And their answer back is they're devastated. And he says, why are they devastated? He said, because the, the temple's up, but the walls are in total crumble. The gates have been burned, and there's no, absolutely no protection for God's people. And the worst thing is this, they don't care. And so this burns deep into Nehemiah's heart, and the first thing that he does is he prays. I read the prayer last time, and we're going to read it again, but it has some the, the in-depth study to it. I'm not just going to read through the rest of the chapter, just verse after verse, but we're going to get it a little bit to time. Keep in mind, in the entire 13 chapters of this book, Nehemiah is on his knees nine times that's recorded, and he prays, he prays, he prays, he prays. He prays. We do not pray as we should and as much as we should. And we will be better people from reading this book and we will be better prayers from reading this book and you will be a better prayer warrior for studying this book. And this is just cool. Okay, here it is. And it came to pass when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. This is around 445 before Christ. B.C. in April, and, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keeps covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. The word terrible actually is saying the great and revered and honored. You are the God of gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. That's what he's saying there. It's not saying, I'm scared to death of you, Lord, to even talk to you. That's not what it was about. He said, God, how great you are and how you are to be revered. And you're the one that you are the keeper of the covenant. And the word keeper there, it's interesting because the word observe is the same word in the Hebrew. Both of them mean guard. And so read it this way and says, you're the great and awesome and revered God that guards the covenant and mercy for them, God's people, that love him 
and guard his commandments. Now, get this. God, the, it's, he was saying, Lord, I know you are the guard of the covenant you made with your people, that we are your select people, your chosen people, that <coughs> Messiah has promised through you, and you've called us to be a unique and a separate people. You're, we are called people of you. And he said, we, and, and you guard that. You guard that relationship. And then he goes on and says, and you have mercy for them that love you and those that guard back your commandments. Now God's, the, the, the condition of God guarding his relationship with his people is not at stake. God will always guard relationship with his people. What is at stake is are we guarding the commandments? Do we see, does the word of God have any effect in our lives anymore? That's, what the, that's just the raw truth of it today and just lay it out before you on the ground. When you read the Bible, does it do anything to you? Does it change you? Does it move you? And, and we got to stick our necks out sometimes. We've got to move from where we are to, to more for the Lord. And just stretch yourself a little bit spiritually. Stretch yourself a little bit in service. Just quit being complacent and happy and everything's really going good. Well, we got Trump in the White House, all things are good now. No, they're not. They will not, all things will not be good until Jesus Christ reigns this earth. All things cannot be good. Things can be better. And things can be worse, but not all things and anything unless the Lord has his hand upon it and he does the reigning. Now, as we as God's people cannot be complacent, and Nehemiah is praying this, let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant. I like the attitude of this man who is number two in the kingdom, but he is a servant to God on his knees which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. The word confess our sins and confess the sins of the people, the word confess there literally means to throw it down, to cast it off. He said, God, I am praying that I and our people May we cast off our sins and cast them down before you. Confess them in before you. We are guilty. Have mercy and save us from our sins and forgive us. And get us moving again. Restore relationship with you again. This is powerful prayer here. Do you know how much this has gripped his heart? That he's in his hands, Nehemiah has a nation. God is burdening him for the nation of Israel, the people, not himself. No wonder he was, he was praying not only in the day, but when also. He says, I pray at night. And you know, there are issues and there have been times in our lives that something is burning and deep in our heart and, and hard and, and that God's going to do a mighty work. We get waking up in the night. We get waking up in the night, and when that happens, that's not by accident, ladies and gentlemen. That's by design, by divine design. It's time to pray in the evening then. God just, nobody here sleeps through the night every, every night in a row. I mean, your whole life, you just say, I never get up in the middle of the night. I don't. God stirs us, and sometimes we'll awaken, and you know, God will, will give a burden to our heart, to our life, it's time to pray. We have dealt very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which your command, that you commanded by your servant or through your servant Moses. And so the, here's what the Hebrew is reading through here. We have dealt very corruptly against you. The word corruptly means but bound. Get this. Oh, this is, this is so, how true we are. We... We bind God, we limit him. We tie him up. We tie his hands. We tie our hands. We just don't believe God can do that. We just don't trust God. We're not willing to step out. We let the cares and the things of this life tear us apart. That we forget 
we, the, the, the answer and the way out is always, we've got to get back to God and get wisdom from God and leading from God and then be willing to shed and to cast down that what he calls us to get rid of. And the word commandments or codes of wisdom, statutes, is a prescribed limit or I'll do it this way. That's Hebrew literally, but it's really saying, here's the boundary line. Don't do that. Thou shalt not. The Ten Commandments. And then there are judgments, or judgments are the judgments are those that are just not judgments, but are justice. Nations need to be a code of laws. You say, where does that all come from? It comes from God. God set up a code of laws for Israel, and any nation that has ever prospered or been successful have applied that into their constitutions or articles or their, their, their form of government. There has to be laws, and when there are laws, there is justice. That all comes from God. And I, I can read and take you to script, scripture all over the place. It's just God's people cry out because there's wicked leadership. And God says, cry out to me. Come back to me. Come back to me. And I'll, I can fix it then. And then we go and do something stupid again. Remember, I beseech you the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you transgress, I'll scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn to me and keep my commandments and do them, though they were of you, the, though there were of you cast out or banished under the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto a place that I've chosen to set my name. This was all a promise of God. What's Nehemiah praying is going to happen? How's the, yeah, how's the cycle going to, what's, what's, where's he want to see and what's he want to see again? He wants to see the nation restored. He wants to see Israel restored again. And he said, we're banished and we're, I'm one of them. He, Nehemiah said, I'm over here as a sort of a captive to the king. I'm his cupbearer. I'm his number two guy. I'm his chief advisor. I have his ear anytime I want it. And he said, but I'm banished. I'm cast out. We need to pull back and, and the nation, pull the people of Israel back in again. Now, these are your servants and your people whom you've redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Man, did he get it? He got this all right. We're God's redeemed people. We're a called people. And Israel's God's select nation. But ladies and gentlemen, we are redeemed people if you know the Lord. We are chosen people. We are God's elite and select choices for this day and age too. Oh, good. I wish my foot was 101% better. I'm ready to click my heels. <laughs> oh. I got close. I'm real good. The doctor released me this week and said, I don't want to sue you again. Your foot's fine. It's progressing well and everything. And I'm, I do real good. And then I got excited. I was headed up to the choir loft and I hit one. I just was walking across just normal floor. And all of a sudden I hit a, had a weak step and I, and I, the next step I just froze. And I said, oh, I guess I'm not all the way 100% yet. But why don't these things heal, you know, like, Overnight. <laughs> you know, I get a canker sore, you know, in the evening sometime, and I go to bed the next morning, or canker sores, it's, they're all gone and everything. Why? Foots should be that way. I mean, I don't chew with them. <laughs> things like that. They should be, you know, healed overnight. Because but, I mean, the yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> but I, it just, some of this stuff just, it's so exciting that it, ah. Oh, you just say, Amen, Lord, how true this is. O Lord, I beseech you, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, to the prayer of thy servants, who desire delight <coughs> to fear thy name, to revere thy name, and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. The word prosper, I did not even do anything with, but I think I did a message on this years, decades ago now. I think there's only four, three times, I think there's only three times that word prosper shows up in the entire Bible. So to preach a prosperity gospel, you don't have a whole lot of footing. You really don't. And it's not prosper with money, it's prosper with heart. 
with soul, prosper with reality. Okay, if you are visiting with us, I started this years ago, and I, it was called a, ba a baker bag, and I'd bring a brown paper bag, and we're up in the conference room, and that's where I started teaching. I'm in my 11th year with a, a lot of you. That's incredible. <laughs> 11 years. And you've stuck with me? There's something wrong with you. <laughs> okay? There's definitely something wrong. So I figure every five years I've got to replenish the whole class, but that's not true here. So you guys are to be commended. You just are hanging in there. Amen. This is good. But what, I did, what we did is when we came down here, I did bring a brown bag in and showed it. But I, in, um, in First Peter, we had the virtual Baker brown bag. And there was things in the bag, the literal bag, that were like visual things to show you. And they, had, they all made a point, and I, I'll leave it at that. Well, I got into, I got thinking when I got into Nehemiah, and I said, this bag business has got to go because we're building. And I actually was out watering, and I saw the red bricks. They were laying around in our food garden. And I saw them, and I said, I've got my idea for the virtual, no more brown bag, we've got a virtual brick. And so we're not throw. there are going to be some bricks that are going to get thrown, but they should not be thrown by us. Okay, uh, you'll see what I mean as you just get down in a couple chapters here. It's, you're going to see that. But these bricks are, are the principles out of the scripture that we need to take with us in our service for the Lord. This is, this is the rubber meets the road. This is the practical stuff. This is the stuff, write this down, take it home, and you've got to rethink and think this stuff through. And there are a couple chapters. There's four of these in there. These things are just loaded. And so let's look at them, first of all. The, the, the first series of bricks that we saw three weeks ago was what Nehemiah saw, and there are only three of those. If you missed it, get the notes from somebody else. In my email to you yesterday, I said, we will be dealing today with what Nehemiah knew, not what he saw, not what God, he saw the nation back again, but this is something that Nehemiah knew. And that he needs, and the word of God and he would, would want that for our lives. Number one is this, prayer deepens burdens. Giving ownership of needs, explain, you say. Okay. Let's just say there's, um, let's, let, I'm going to use food pantry. As many of you work in a food pantry. I, I, I'll just bring that up. I was, I was there Friday and had the privilege of sitting for their, their prayer before they opened their doors, their prayer time, and there was just Chad and Doug uh, uh, Paisley. Um, did I get it right? Good. Um, he was sharing some of the, the needs, some of the, the blessings that God had done, and I was just sitting there taking that in because it's a ministry of the church, and so I'm part of it in that sense, and Carol and I bring stuff every week, but we... I don't go out there. I don't feel burdened to go out there. But let's say that I did go out there, or I was trying to decide wanted, if I was God wanted me out there to work the food pantry. Here's what I need to do. Not be an idiot and just say, whoopee, here I am. Put me to work. I need to pray about it. Now, when somebody says, you need to pray about this, or you say, oh, I'm going to go home and pray about it, this is how you should pray about it. You need to pray and pray and pray and say, Lord, if you're leading me this, this way, I need to pray about that and you need to do this to me. Burden my heart. Make me think this, make me walk this, and make me live this. May this just grab me, is what I'm saying. That's how we pray. And it's not pray, Lord, bless our supper and give me a burden for the food pantry. Amen. It's you need to specifically pray for that. Now, I'm going to take this a step further, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but I don't care. Because this is a couple things down the, down, lessons down the road, and we're going to revisit again. If you are already in the food pantry, if you're already teaching a Bible study, if you are already leading and doing something, you need to be praying that God burdens your heart further and opens up your mind and your heart and say, Lord, how can we do it better? How can we do it bigger? How can we reach more? What are we not doing right here? 
What needs corrected? Give me new ideas. You starting to catch it? My prayer for this class is never ending. As long as I stand here as your teacher. Because I just don't whip something out on you on Sunday morning and say, oh, let me, I, I load it on the computer. Let's see what's on the computer here and see what I'm going to do today. That's not how you do that. That's not ministry. That's not work. That's not God's plan. That's not how God wants us to do. Pray, because what happens is this. As you pray, all of a sudden, you're starting to become part of that. You're getting ownership of it. It's starting to become you. And you're going to start thinking it and start walking it and you start breathing it. It becomes you. You get attached to it. Some of you are looking for things to do or you're already doing things for the Lord and you maybe say, well, I, I'm looking at this or that. That's why that sheet of all the ministries I gave you. Maybe just go home and look them over. Find out who runs them. Find out what's going on. See what's happening. Some of you are in the choir. Same thing should be true of the choir. Do you ever stop to think and just pray for the choir? <clears throat> we say, well, the choir's in good hands. We have a mu music director and we have a pianist. Um, every, every, all of you know Todd, our pianist is in our class. A ton of you in the choir, and the, in, a ton of the choir is in here. We have a grand old time in there. It's great. We should pray for it. it can, choir can get tiresome. Anything can get tiresome and needs refueled. Number two, Nehemiah knew this. Prayer quiets our hearts to wait, slowing us down to receive God. I hate this brick. I hate this brick. Because in truth, and this is not a brag, this is a prayer request to you. When I get up in the morning, my feet hit running. I have to be slowed down. Now, I'm going to tell you something about me, and I don't share my past with you guys, with anybody a whole lot, just because it's the past and etc. I was on, I was, when we were, oh, how old were we? Oh, no, maybe going into our 30s, late, late 20s, we had the opportunity to go back to our home church and be assistant pastor and be on the church staff there. We were there for seven years, and not only had I learned that originally at our church we were married at and I was ordained there, and all sorts of cool things happened there, building programs, etc. But it was time to leave, and... Um, I was headed to take the pastor to the church and did that. And so I went in to see the, my friend and the pastor of the church, and we sat down and we just chatted, and uh, he'd been in it and preached in it and knew about it and had recommended my, me. And um, I asked him a question. I said, what's the biggest piece of advice you could give me personally, because you know me? You, we lived together. The rest of the staff, I mean, part, all of us lived at the church. And I said, tell me the biggest thing that could help me personally that's not, not a book to read or to do this. And he looked at me and said, that's easy. And he was chuckling. And I said, what? He said, I just heard it said, slow yeah. down. He said, slow down down. He said, you go so fast, you leave people behind. And I do. I talk so fast, don't I? That some of you have trouble catching up, don't you? I know. Believe it or not, I've slowed down. You do not want to know what I was. Prayer quiets our heart to wait. Don't be so quick to grab it and rush off with it, because what you're doing is you're, you're you're getting it too soon, and you don't have clear direction and clear burden for it. Slowing us down gives us an opportunity to listen to God, and it's what does God have to say to us? Prayer infuses. Now, infu I was told that I could have probably one more back surgery and have one of the discs cleaned off and be okay if it was above or below the one that I had four years ago, and I could 
just walk out of there. I would start to have limited bending over, which I shouldn't be doing anyway. However, I was told anything beyond that, they would have to fuse my spine, basically, or put metal back in there to hold things together. And then, of course, mobility is greatly reduced or starts to become that. Okay, that's what it's talking about. Prayer infusions infuses the vision, enabling us to see what God wants us to do. What happens is we spend in time in prayer, the, the rod and the, the, the hand of God and the fire of God in our soul infuses that and makes that, it's, it's, it's in us. It's a fire within us. And we're there. That's commitment. I mean, we'll do anything. Some of you guys that are in here and women, you put the school together. You hammered those little booths and desks and walls. And when Northside Christian School was starting, it didn't matter what time it was on the clock. Or if we ran out of some kind of a materials here, oh, hey, we need, a, we need to go get this. It didn't matter if the church had the money or not. You just went and got it. Because it was infused, the burden of the school was infused on you. You can see the product of your prayer and your work and the fusion that God did in your life. You got an incredible thing at Northside Christian School now. But it took that. And it enables us and clears our mind and our vision for what to do. Prayer initiates vision's fulfillment, acting as a catalyst for us to act. All of a sudden, we're getting fulfilled in our life as in our service to the Lord. We go and say, boy, did I get a blessing out of that. Boy, that was good today. Boy, when I walked out of there, it was just I didn't want to leave. I want to be part of that. I want to be around those kind of people. I want to be able to do that. I want to pray with that person and share with that person and be part of that. And, and, and it just, it's a catalyst that gets us in motion. It'll get us and it'll give us that drive. I'll tell you, I, I pray, I ask God every time I'm ready to come out here, come to church Sunday morning and get on this floor. I pray, God, I pray through this, and I say, I need to be the, the, the message today needs to be so infused in me. I need to be, and then it's time for me to act, and to teach, and do whatever it is. Nehemiah knew this, and he applied these things. Nehemiah has not left the palace yet. He's 800 miles from Israel. He hasn't picked up one stone but he sure is getting ready, isn't he? Because when he gets there, he will have the power of God upon his life. And things are going to fly in a lot of directions. That's just incredible. Well, I, did, I closed with the king's cupbearer with you last time. And I'm going to do something. Shane, 